we are going to be in a situation where everything that we once represented is has evaporated and we will now have to operate from a very different place and that's going to be difficult this is the friends of history debating society i am gaius and germanicus makovleos is here we're in londinium it's autumn now it's cooler a lot of wind in the morning and the thames is turbulent the retired centurions and their families say shop early and get home you want to get dinner done and then go to bed and not waste money on candles at the same time, we're watching the 21st century where there's no decision yet on the new emperor. Is it going to be the old emperor? Or is it going to be a complete departure? The question here is, how, do, how can you tell from 2,000 years away? We're in Londinium, where it's the first century AD. What we know is not democracy. We know authority. And I want to point to an authoritative event in these last days, in the 21st century, that may or may not touch on the new emperor decision-making in America. This is my observation, as Gaius, of the success of Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, and the IDF, to fight like Romans. How did Romans fight? Relentlessly, for total victory. No negotiation. Capitulation is the only thing they wanted to hear. And then they decap. They do not imprison. They decap forever. Example, Vercingetorix, who rises to be the hero of the Gauls against Caesar, gathering together the tribes and taking on Caesar's legion. Eventually, after several battles, he retreats with his soldiers to Elysia, somewhere in France today. And they are surrounded by the Roman legions who dig what they usually do, a wall and a trench. They surround the city, which is itself walled. And that the reason they do that is they starve it to death. At some point in this surround the city, Vercingetorix realizes there wasn't enough food to feed both his soldiers and the population. Help is said to be on the way. The word has gone out to the Gallic tribes to come to the rescue of Vercingetorix, so he's got to buy time. He sends the population out, thinking that Caesar will accept them. Caesar does not. They both sit in their citadels, watching the, the population of Valicia starve to death in the fields between. That's Roman. Germanicus, a very good evening to you. My observation about Rome in the 21st century... It's not attractive. It certainly doesn't meet the standards of the United Nations or of peacekeepers around the world, but it's recognizable to us in the first century AD. Is it purposeful or am I projecting too much? Good day to you. <laughs> Good evening, guys. The, the long thread of continuity between Rome in antiquity at the time of Caesar, the Gallic Wars in Elysia, to Israel today is bright and unbroken. And the, the truth is that the Romans had been in Gaul for several decades before Caesar went in and decided he was going to conquer the place. He did so in a brutal and ruthless way. And uh, from what we know now, over a million Gauls, the ancestors of today's Frenchmen, were slaughtered. And the siege of Elysia and the destruction of the leadership of Versailles-Jetorix is highly reminiscent of um, Hassan Nazarullah and the uh, frontline resistance to Israel from not just Hezbollah, but also the Houthis and, of course, Hamas. And all of this speaks to a kind of vision from antiquity that is pre-Christian. 
And the uh, Roman approach was always to destroy the enemy, kill all the men, and sell all the women and children into slavery. And of course, this is the path that Israel is pursuing now, and it's a very successful path. And when it is completed, who is to say anything because it's all been done? It's finished. And, you know, um, not to put too fine a point on it, the ruling class in Israel have a provenance in Germany, and they have imbibed and brought with them many of the um, relentless, victorious urges of the German homeland. And in many ways, they are not simply Roman, but also German. And of course, the Germans looked back to the Romans as well for centuries, even millennia. So you have a warrior society. Israel is not a, a professional warrior society as, say, Rome was in the empire. Israel, in fact, does resemble more perfectly Rome in the late Republican era, which was a, a, an army, the Roman army, that was composed of free citizens who had an obligation to the city, which was what Rome was. And Israel, of course, is very much like the Roman city-state. And the Israeli army is not a, a fancy professional army. It's more like a National Guard. And yet Israel, in many ways, uh, um, encapsulates and captures the ethos of the late Roman Republic. And under Caesar, Rome was able to bring a stubborn gall to submission through absolute slaughter and to make uh, a, an incredibly symbolic ritual theater out of the final Gallic stand at Elysia. And that is exactly what Israel is doing now and with Lebanon. It is making, a, 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 a shaping a context and a theater in which Hezbollah will be brought down as the Gauls were, to the point where they simply have to submit, where they are slaughtered and brought to heel. And I think this is a powerful strategic gambit because what Israel is doing by extension is to demonstrate to uh, rather anxious and frightened uh, Sunni Arab potentates like Egypt, but also especially Saudi Arabia and the Gulf principalities that the Shia threat, the Shia scourge cannot continue. So you have a very powerful alliance between Israel and uh, the Sunni Arab Islam, and uh, that may yet prevail. And it, it's very close in some ways to what Rome was able to accomplish in the period of Caesar by uh, becoming the protector of the Greek East. So in place of the Greek East for Israel, read Sunni Arab Islam, at least in the yeah. What I like about that is that Rome, once it solved the Gallic resistance, and it did that by it captured Vercingetorix, took him back to Rome, put him in a triumph, then strangled him. It wasn't they weren't going to leave him in place to talk about it. The same for his leadership. What I like about it is that Rome brought peace. It was the peace of Rome, but it lasted what fifteen hundred years. May, it might still be here in the the case of the American piece. Right. The, the, the difficulty for us, meaning us, the United States, is that having essentially uh, completely supported Israel all along, that we will lose our capacity 
to relate to many other states in the world. I think Israel will eventually be fine because they have this implicit, if cruel and cynical, compact with uh, Sunni Arab states, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states. But we are going to be in a situation where everything that we once represented is has evaporated, and we will now have to operate from a very different place, and that's going to be difficult. Let's talk about it, because there were events these last days where the White House entertained the leader of Ukraine, demonstrating not the strongest horse, the other thing. The strongest horse is what Israel will now be uh, rewarded with in the Middle East, but not, not Washington. I'm talking to Germanicus. We're talking about events that happened in our time, first century BCE. It's vivid to us. It's our education. We're Romans. Vercingetorix had to die, not exist as an old man remembering once upon a time he fought Caesar. He had to die. And all those years later, everybody remembered, you do not negotiate with the Romans. You say, yes, or you will be broken. We, we've watched very carefully when the emperor shows strength or weakness. These last days, the leader of the Ukrainian state, Zelensky, traveled to Pennsylvania and signed artillery shells in the front of a democratic governor and then traveled to Washington and spoke traveled to the United Nations, made a speech, traveled to Washington and met with the president, asking for, in exchange for his victory plan, a trillion dollars. In addition, he wanted permission to use storm shadows to strike into Russia. In addition, he wanted NATO membership. And in addition, he wanted EU membership, pronto, expedited. And in exchange for that, his victory plan, which is unknown. We don't have all those secrets. I mention all this because he was asking the president to deliver this. The president of the United States, no, at this moment, does not have that power. Just as the president continued to tell Israel, no, 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 ceasefire, ceasefire in Hamas, and then ceasefire, ceasefire in Hezbollah. There's reason to believe that Sinwar is dead. There's reason, more than reason to believe that Nasrallah is dead. While the president is saying no, no, no. And when Ukraine shows up, the president says no, no, no. Germanicus, translating our understanding of Rome, this is not authority. This is not power. The two people who are contesting to take that seat in the White House in 2025. What does this tell them about what's awaiting them? And what does this tell the American people about the, uh, the authority of the United States in the two active contests now underway? Well, we are Romans. Are we not Romans? And one of the great banes of Rome in its imperial period, and even earlier, back in the period of the Jugurthine Wars with Marius, the bane of Rome were rogue client states. And uh, Mr. Obama, some time back before most memory, gave the Ukraine portfolio to Mr. Biden when he was vice president. And that became a corrupt and incestuous enterprise that led us inevitably to this war. So corrupt that it will probably never be uncovered. But the fact is that we created this war, we shaped it, crafted it, made it happen. And now the war we created and sustained and made Mr. Zelensky the the sort of puppet figurehead for however iconic he might be in the world press and all the rest, that is coming apart. And so this entire fated and corrupt enterprise is collapsing. 
And what you see in the latest visit of Mr. Zelensky is a desperate desire of the White House and the addled, decaying emperor and his courtiers to disassociate themselves from this enterprise that has gone south. And yet they cannot completely do that. And so it becomes, uh, uh, you know, in the words of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, an albatross around the neck of this administration. And by extension, the person who wants to succeed the current emperor, uh, who is actually a part of this administration and has been for the last four years. And so she, in effect, carries all of the baggage and um, the albatross has now been passed on to her and hangs around her neck. And that becomes an issue because the Ukraine war was lost two years ago. It was lost from the beginning. But as it becomes clear that this is coming to a kind of fateful denouement, this will resound in the most negative possible way on uh, the blue enterprise with the election coming up. So everything now is to postpone the inevitable. And yet, I don't know that that can be done. It's quite clear that the U.S. enterprise in Ukraine has had enormous negative repercussions. It, It has led China to believe that the U.S. is a declining power because the U.S. has been incapable of bringing victory by supporting Ukraine. Plus, the proxy war having failed as badly as it has essentially tells the Chinese that uh, Taiwan can either choose to be destroyed by being an American proxy or to choose a more reasonable path and preserve the life of its people. Uh, And in effect, we're seeing in NATO across the board in um, what are called right wing, but are actually simply normal conservative responses to the way in which NATO has followed the US down the primrose path into recession. NATO itself is up for grabs now. It, it, it no longer has the confidence in terms of the electorates, not the elites, of course, in the EU. They still are complete vassals of the US, but the NATO uh, EU electorates are losing confidence in the US. So the war has been an absolute disaster, and that could go on and on in a conversation. But This has to be, from the standpoint of blue, postponed just a little longer. And if not, it will it will dramatically affect. The election. Bodica, dear to us, of course, because we were as children, we were frightened of her. She's gone now. She's not coming back. But I remember that the first legions sent against Bodica were massacred. Yes. And then we sent another legion, and that didn't do well. Then we sent another legion, and that did very well. Bodica was wiped out. Her memory was wiped out. Her children, her tribe, everything, the ICI. Now, is that possible for Ukraine? It seems ridiculous to ponder that, but that would be the only reason to stay attached to Ukraine's victory plan that they can be, they can be, they can somehow not be Bodica. Do we believe that's possible? Because Russia's coming to wipe them out. Well, what can I say? They're already past a Boudicca. They've already been laid waste to. They're already ruined. I, I agree with you. The Germanicus, that's why I posited it. It seems yeah. so absurd that they could resist Russia. But it's been that way for two and a half years. Their only path forward, which is the Zelensky 
uh, Philippic is to get Europe and the U.S. engaged in World War III. In other yeah. words, to get missiles to strike deep into Russia and for Russia to unleash things that would precipitate a world war. And he knows that that's a very unlikely outcome, but that is his last hope. This is the final gambit. And so I they're doing this to get past November 5th. They know that. Yes. Oh, 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 the blue, blue must keep everything on ice. If they can keep it on ice and nothing happens, then that aspect, that flank, if you will, will be covered. There are other flanks where they're doing much worse. But if the Ukrainian flank were to come apart in the next 40 days, that would be the end for Blue. But Blue does recognize that Ukraine is Bodica. It's going to be wiped out. Yes, yes. But they do it sotto voce. And meanwhile, they keep lying to the American people and creating this or rather sustaining this gigantic deception project that Ukraine can be rescued, survive, be victorious. And eventually this will crash down. They yeah. just want the giant crash to be postponed for 40 days. This is the Friends of History Debating Society. I am Gaius and Germanicus is here. And we've turned to discussing a subject that probably would get us into trouble if we were in Rome. But we're not in Rome. We're in Londinium. And we're not writing anything down. We're just talking to the 21st century. Pretty safe. And we're talking in a way that's very difficult to interpret the first three times you'll look at it. The Gracchi brothers. Let me remind you. Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. They were brothers. And their mom was Cornelia. They were raised to be reformers. And when they were rejected, because they were part of the elite, they were landed gentry. When they were rejected because they had ideas, land reform, we would call it redistribution. And when those ideas were rejected, they went to the plebes and had themselves demoted from being senators or equus class into being the tribune, the tribunate of the plebes. And Roman law at that point was sufficiently complicated that the tribune of the plebes could make an appeal to the Senate that had weight. Well, what they brought forward is land reform. And once Tiberius, the older brother, did that, they essentially murdered him. Something about the mob, something about tearing him apart on the steps of the forum, all that elaborate bric-a-brac that is Roman drama. And then 10 years later, his younger brother did the same thing and they tore him apart and threw him down the steps. Why? And therein lies the mystery. I want your thoughts, Germanicus, because looking at what they were recommending and eventually it was all adopted as a way of pleasing the plebes. But was it socialism? Is that what the Krakai brothers represent? Socialism. 2,000 years, more than that, 2,200 years later, we're still arguing over it. Well, having enjoyed one of the greatest courses of my life at Yale with Ramsey McMullen, a course called Roman Imperialism, which looked exactly at this period, and then looking at today, it is not going out on a limb to say that the Gracchi brothers are best represented today Strangely, and perhaps many will find this difficult, they're represented by Mr. Trump. In effect, look at the context and the um, evocations. The, they're not parallels, but they're resonances. They gave up their aristocratic station, so has Mr. Trump. He went to the WWF. He bonded with the people. Um, the Gracchi brothers were killed by the Senate. Mr. Trump has had to endure two assassination attempts and all of the calls for his assassination, however thinly veiled, by the same Senate. The Senate has done everything possible to destroy him 
to to essentially assassinate him just as the Roman Senate assassinated with their stout oak clubs, both of the Gracchi brothers. And effectively, when Mr. Trump goes out there and talks about, oh, no tax on tips, no tax on Social Security, and and all of this, and the fact that he is uh, endorsed and has support from the labor unions that were once indissolubly part of blue back in the old days. The fact that the Teamsters are one with Mr. Trump tells you that there has been a sea change in American politics, and it does not bode well for the United States because, and this is important, we need to stop looking at Mr. Trump as a populist and start looking at him in the venue through the eyes and the filter of of Rome during the late Republic with the Gracchi brothers. In other words, the, the changes going on in Roman society during the later Republic, in which you had a massive shift in wealth and income toward equus and senatorial class, and not only an impoverishment, but a, 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 a terrible debasement of, of Roman citizens, especially those who served as legionnaires. And this is very comparable to the situation that has attained in the U.S. in the last 30 years. So you have the people who have been deserted and left behind and who have no way ahead to be productive and who are hurting. They are going for Mr. Trump, and this includes you know, African-Americans, Latinos, it is a very powerful shift that's occurring, and it is very comparable to what happened in the late Roman Republic. And you know how things turned out in the late Roman Republic. Is it fussy of me to say that his ideas are impractical? Well, so were the Gracchi ideas. Yes, they, they wouldn't were. happen. However, what happened after the Gracchi were killed? What happened or what will happen after Mr. Trump is gone? Well, there was a dictator named Sulla, but then he retired. Yes, because and, and we had what the happened Trump, is at, at some we had a point, civil war. We had a civil war, several. Several. And what happens eventually, or what happened with Rome, is that the big man who who identified with the popularis just like the Gracchi brothers, but unlike the Gracchi brothers, they were generals who led the legions. So they led the armed people to create a new Rome. And the Senate had to accommodate to that. Right now, the senatorial class in America is trying to impose the kind of fiat control that the Roman Senate did during the period of the Gracchi. But I think, like the contretemps and un instability that came after the Gracchi brothers, this will fail. And so I think we're headed into a long period of turbulence with outcomes but that frankly look very Roman, John. We have a retiring president from the Senate. We have a nominee from the Senate. And we have the Gracchi brothers. Imagine Trump as a Gracchi. What would Cornelius say, Germanicus? Germanicus is Michael Vallejos. I am Gaius John Batson. We're going to sacrifice to Augustus, who we believe is successful because he died in his sleep. None of the others much did. Um, we're going to a performance tonight, we're told, of the scene between Hector and Paris. This is the Iliad, where Hector, who is the great warrior of Troy, fights Ajax and defeats him. Hector says to Paris, you know, you started all this because Helen's the most beautiful mortal woman you'd ever seen, but you're spending all of your time being the pretty boy of Troy. Why don't you come out and fight with us? And all was on Paris's mind was to drag Helen around the palace some more. Hector is very unhappy. 
Hector's most admirable, but he's very unhappy. And we're going to watch that scene tonight. I laugh. The Greeks take it very seriously. They weep. They regard Hector as speaking correctly. Hector's wife, by the way, is Andromaca. Andromaca can see things. And when she appeals to Hector, don't go out there. She says, I can see what's going to happen if you go out there. And indeed it did. Hector died. She was sold into slavery. And their baby in her arms was thrown over the walls. Andromaca. But tonight we're just going to deal with Hector and Paris. This is the Friends of History Debating Society in Londinium. I'm John Batchelor.